ఎక్స్క్యూజ్ మీ ఒకసారి చెక్ చేస్తారా వస్తుంది స్టార్ట్ స్ట్రీమింగ్ ఉన్నా ఎస్ డాక్టర్ దిలీప్ ఎస్ గుడ్ మార్నింగ్ ఆల్ యాజ్ అ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ ప్రాక్టికల్ ఓరియంటేషన్ లెక్చర్స్ టుడే వీఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు డిస్కస్ అబౌట్ ది ఎగ్జామినేషన్ ఆఫ్ యూనిట్ ఎస్టర్డే డాక్టర్ ప్రీతి మేడం హెస్ కవర్డ్ అబౌట్ ద హిస్టరీ టేకింగ్ ఆస్పెక్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద యూనిటల్ ఎగ్జామినేషన్ టుడే వీఆర్ గోయింగ్ టు డిస్కస్ అబౌట్ ద ఫిజికల్ ఎగ్జామినేషన్ పార్ట్ ఆఫ్ ద యూనిట్ బిఫోర్ గెటింగ్ ఇన్ టు ద టాపిక్ జస్ట్ ఎ స్మాల్ అడ్వైస్ సో వెన్ యూఆర్ ప్రిపేరింగ్ ఫర్ ద ఎగ్జామ్ యూ నీడ్ టు గివ్ ఎ కంప్లీట్ హానెస్ట్ ఎఫర్ట్ so by uh, learning you when you give a honest effort at least you retain something which is quite sufficient for your practical examinations when your effort itself is restricted to exam kind of learning you retain you retain nothing and you find difficulties in examination so my sincere advice is to have a honest effort so that you learn complete aspect of the neonatal examination rather than exam kind of orientation kind of uh, uh, learning so i tried my level best to give a uh, complete examination of the neonat so let's get into the topic so at the exam at the end of uh, your neonatal examination you should able to classify these are the learning uh, objectives at the end of the neonatal examination you should be able to classify newborns based on weight based on gestational age and based on weight centiles and then you should understand basic understanding of what is apgar score uh, its interpretation inter- interpretation and then assess growth measurements assess vital signs estimate the gestational age assess the different body systems and recognize normal findings in the newborn examination recognize common neonatal problems and assessment of feeding so at the end of your presentation you should be able to learn all these things so these are the five steps of neonatal examination so preparation observation examination explanation and documentation so for a neonatal examination you need to prepare yourself for the uh, examination so what are all the uh, things include under preparation so you so neonatology is all about anticipation of things so when you have a good solid history then you can anticipate the things in newborn and you can prepare accordingly so you need to take a complete uh, history so which has been covered yesterday by dr preeti madam and then gather all the equipment required for the examination and most important thing is wash and warm your hands the most common cause of neo- neonatal mortality in india is neonatal sepsis and the simple and effective way of preventing neonatal sepsis or decreasing the incidence of neonatal sepsis is by washing your hands before examining the newborn because neonates are very fragile and they are more prone for infection so when you wash your hands properly before examination of neonate you can avoid uh, uh, transferring infections to the baby through your hands so the history aspect actually madam has covered about the history aspect so these are all the things so that has to be taken in the history family history med past medical history of the mother past obstetric history present obstetric antenatal natal postnatal then you need to listen to the carer so you need to take some history from the carers those are providing care to the baby so regarding baby you need to ask about the how is the behavior of the child child is normal or baby is irritable or quite sleepy and then you need to talk uh, take about the feeding aspect as well so how baby is being fed whether breast feeds are being given or bottle feeding or formal i mean formula feeding so our breast feeding uh, is sufficient and then you need to ask about is there any history suggest of feeding ill tran trans like vomiting abdominal distension kind of stuff then you need to ask about whether uh, at what point of time baby has passed urine how frequently baby is passing urine and how frequently baby is passing stools these kind of things you need to ask you need to get this history from the uh, 
carer or the attendant who is uh, providing care to the baby who is with mother and baby then you need to ask about the mother uh, history about the mother from mother aspect as well so uh, i mean mother is caring enough towards the baby or also you need to look into it that as well so these are the things you need to take from the history then gather all the necessary equipment for your examinations like stethoscope tape infantometer for Mm, weighing the baby and also for uh, measuring the length of the baby and then you need to have centile charts penton centile charts then newborn uh, new ballard score chart then ophthalmoscope for red reflex and then spatula for examining the uh, mouth and uh, throat so then you need to wash your hands so mm, one should be able to know about double h of six steps of hand washing each step should be for 20 seconds and total 2 minutes so these are the 6 steps of hand washing so first your palms then your dorsal surface of the palms and then knuckles then your thumb so each step should be at least for uh, 20 seconds uh, and it uh, represents at least 5 times so uh, thumbs followed by tips of the fingers then your from wrist to elbow so with proper hand washing uh, you will proceed to the newborn examination and after uh, washing your hands you need to dry your hands and warm your uh, hands by rubbing because um, um, hypothermia you can i mean your hands will be cool and it might irritate the newborn and irritation of newborn hampers your examination further examination so before examining you need to warm your hands so with this basic uh, setup let's proceed into the newborn examination so <clears throat> when to examine the newborn so you will get the opportunity immediately after birth within 24 hours of birth daily during hospital stay at discharge or follow up or during episode of illness so these are the uh, scenarios where you will get the opportunity to examine the newborn so immediately after birth uh, stress has been uh, there on the apgar assessment of uh, apgar and vitals and to look for birth trauma and to look for obvious malformations and birth weight so let's have a look at apgar score so apgar score is assessed at one minute of life five minutes then every five minutes until its value is more than six so and then uh, one minute apgar indicates uh, mm, i mean it's an indicate index of intrapartum de depression and apgar beyond one minute reflects changing how baby has adapted to the extra uterine environment and if at all baby requires uh, resuscitative efforts it tells about it tells you about the adequacy of the resuscitative efforts so a value of more than seven indicates baby con baby's condition is good and value less than four necessitate to continue resuscitation so apgar is a good predictor of survival but using it to predict long-term outcome is inappropriate so these are all the things about apgar so you have five components in apgar heart rate respiratory effort muscle tone and reflex irritability and color so you have zero score one two so the maximum score is 10 and minimum score is zero and to label babies uh, doing well so you need to have a apgar score more than seven so it is assessed at one minute and five minutes then you'll uh, and at uh, 24 hours of life you need to again check for vitals anthropometry gestational age assessment head to toe examination systemic examination assessment and assessment of feeding and then during daily examination you need to look for weight you need to assess the feeding and look for common neonatal problems and look for any danger signs in the newborn so with the history you will get to know about the gestational age either by through lmp or scan edd you will get to know about the gestational age so newborn is classified based on gestational age as preterm so when the gestational age is less than 37 weeks then you label the neonate as preterm so 37 to 42 then you label it as term and beyond 42 you label it as post term then from 37 weeks to 38 weeks you label it as early term and then that uh, beyond 38 completed weeks you level it as full term so when it comes to preterm when the gestation age is less than 28 weeks you level it as extremely preterm child baby when it is 28 to 34 weeks you label it 
so the baby uh, you label the baby as early preterm and from 34 weeks to 37 weeks you label the baby as late preterm then so what are the complications of preterm so you should have an idea because when you, you expect the baby to be preterm you anticipate certain kind of complications on the preterm and you need to uh, seriously look in uh, for, uh, for uh, picking up those complications at an early point of time in the preterm so obviously all the systems are immature in a preterm so you tend to baby tends to have a uh, complication in all the systems and so let's start with respiratory system so child can have complications in respiratory system in the form of respiratory distress syndrome or highland membrane disease then you can have apnea prematurity and then you can have a chronic lung disease then from cns point of view the preterm child can is more prone for perinatal depression intracranial hemorrhages and long term periventricular leukomalacia and cvs point of view baby can land up having hypotension or uh, adductus uh, arteriosus may remain patent from hematological point of view baby can have anemia hyperbilirubinemia anemia polycythemia and from gastrointestinal point of view necrotizing improcalities feed intolerance and from metabolic point of view hypoglycemia hypocalcemia renal fluid and electrolyte imbalances temperature hypothermia iatrogenic hyperthermia and immunological sepsis i retinopathy of prematurity so when you when the baby is preterm so you anticipate these problems in the preterm and you need to frequently thoroughly check the preterm for these complications then what are the complications of postterm sometimes baby might deliver beyond 42 weeks of life because of faulty estimation of uh, gestational age um, so what are the complications in a postterm and uh, neonate so these are the complications so child can develop bipony aspiration syndrome birth injury perinatal depression there are high risk of high chance of fetal intrapartum and neonatal death in a postterm neonate so so this picture tells you that not all term infants are the same so these are all the term infants but you see one child is having uh, was weighing 3.65 kg and one child looks very small and is weighing around and baby is weighing around 1.8 kg and one child looks big and weighing around 4.4 kg so not all term infants are the same so you end up uh, might end up having a term child with low birth weight term child with the uh, large for gestational age and term child with appropriately gestational age and this is one more way of classifying the baby based on birth weight you'll you label the child as low birth weight when the weight is less than 2.5 kg when it is less than 1.5 kg you label it as very low birth weight and when it is less than 1 kg you label it as extremely low birth weight and then based on birth uh, weight centiles you label it as appropriate for gestational age when the weight lies between the weight lies between the 10th and 90th centile when the weight lies less than 10th centile then it is the baby is considered small for gestation age when baby weighs more than 19th centile for the gestation age then you label the child as large for gestation age so these are the content uh, uh, growth charts for classifying the babies into appropriate gestational age small for gestational age and large for gestational age so these are the content growth charts so you need to carry these growth charts while examining the baby and then what is the sjp baby so we have already discussed that either birth weight or uh, birth crown heel length length of the baby is less than 10 centile for gestational age or less than two standard deviation below the mean then you label that uh, child as sga babies so often SGA and IUGR, IUGR means intrauterine growth retardation. Often you, they are used interchangeably in spite of difference. So IUGR, so there is a difference between SGA baby and IUGR baby. But most of the times they are used uh, interchangeably. I mean, uh, so what is IUGR baby? So IUGR baby is having a diminished growth velocity in the fetus as documented by at least two intrauterine growth assessment so basically it is fetus falling of its own growth curve then you label the uh, neonate as iugr baby uh, 
so the norm is all iugr babies can be sga but all sga babies cannot be iugr so some babies are constitutionally small for gestational age and have less complications compared to iugr so baby so parents are being small so babies also obviously will remain small for gestational age so when you go back to history even uh, baby's mother and father, father might be a small for gestational age so like this constitutional like you have a constitutional short stature constitutional delayed puberty so on similar terms it's a constitutional sga so you have father and mother being sga then obviously baby will also be sga so babies with have those who are having constitutional sga tend to have less complications compared to iugr baby so yeah, iugr babies are further classified into asymmetrical iugr and symmetrical iugr based on pondrian pondrian index so the uh, for uh, formula for calculation ponder ponderal index is weight in grams by height in centimeters cube into 100 so normally in a term appropriately gestational age babies aja babies the ponderal index will be more than 2.5 for asymmetrical iugr the value remains less than 2 and for symmetrical iugr the value remains more than 2 so in a symmetrical iugr all the measurements are decreased like your head circumference will get decreased your length will get decreased weight will get decreased the insult starts from early part of the uh, uh, intrauterine period from tri first trimester all, uh, uh, onwards baby <laughs> fetus is exposed to the insect so all the parameters will get decreased so you have a normal near normal pondry index then you can label the child as symmetrical iugr so when uh, the insult happens in later part of pregnancy that is towards third trimester only weight is affected and the head circumference and length are spared then child and uh, will uh, baby i mean fetus end up will having an asymmetrical iugr in right right growth determination so so what is symmetrical uh, uh, intrauterine growth fraction as we have discussed the head circumference length weight all remains less than 10 centile so all gets decreased so you have normal near normal pondry index so 33 percent of the aga babies usually have and symmetrical iugr so the cause usually will be an insult in the early part of the uh, part of uh, gestation intrauterine period like uh, intrauterine infections chromosomal abnormalities exposure to tetrogen drugs so they all insult the baby in the first trimester itself so baby end up uh, having a symmetric ligature so when the insult happens in later part of the pregnancy that is towards the third uh, trimester so you have an asymmetric iugr or head sparing iugr where only weight is affected so weight remains less than 10 centile whereas the head circumference and length remains normal so 55 percent of the aga babies are usually have asymmetric iugr and these babies have a low pondrial index and the cause for asymmetric iugr these are the causes so uteroplacental insection see preeclampsia placental impacts so these uh, are the causes for asymmetric language here. So then you should know about the complications of SG and IUGR babies. So SG and IUGR babies, you can have congenital anomalies in the baby, perinatal repression, meconium aspiration, pulmonary hemorrhage, persistent pulmonary hypertension, hypotension, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia polycythemia, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and dyslipnemia, acute renal infections. So these are the complications of SGA babies. So whenever you are going to examine SGA, basically with the history itself, you can come to an A whether this baby is an appropriate like gestational age or SGA baby. Because in history, you will get to know the birth weight as well as the gestational age. So you can classify based on history itself. And while examining, you need to look for all these complications. So you need to have these all these complications in your mind and you need to uh, examine the baby keeping these complications in mind so that you can pick up at an early point of time and you can manage so the long term outcomes of SGI IUGR babies are poor postnatal growth and neurological impairment there can be delayed cognitive development there can be poor academic achievements and, there can, and then SGI and IUGR babies are at high risk of having coronary artery disease, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, stroke, renal failure
then the other spectrum is large for gestational age so when the birth weight um, is more than 90th centile for gestational age or more than two standard deviation above the mean birth weight for gestational age then you level the child as uh, large for gestational age so what are the causes of large for gestational age so it can be constitutional likewise we have discussed you not know, in a sga babies you can have sga parents so baby uh, is also remains sga so likewise large when you have large parents i mean uh, being uh, an obese parent then you can have a lga baby so which is constitutional then infants of diabetic mother can uh, uh, can also remain lga the reason being uh, when mother is diabetic because of high sugar levels and these high, high sugars will cross placenta and baby also end up having hyperglycemia and this hyperglycemia stimulates insulin so insulin is more like a growth factor so it stimulates growth of the tissues so thereby infants of diabetic mothers uh, end up uh, 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 as a lga babies then the other syndromic uh, entities like beckwith weidman syndrome hydrox vitalis so these are the babies can end up as lga babies so then what are the complications of lga babies so birth trauma hypoglycemia and polycythemia this so these are the complications of lga babies so with this background let's get into examination physical examination part of the neonate so examination of neonate so these are the steps i mean ways of examining the neonate so try to gather as much of information by observing before disturbing the baby so once baby gets disturbed then it's quite difficult to assess vitals body measurements head to toe systemic examination so gather all the information as much as you can without disturbing the baby so that's the uh, i mean tip for uh, carrying out a proper examination of the baby so what are all the things you can uh, look into the baby without disturbing the neonate is one first thing is color so uh, healthy neonate usually appears pink in color so other uh, uh, colors you can come across is bluish discoloration when child is when baby is cyanotic when baby is anemic you can have a paler neonate when baby is plethoric you have a ruddiness i mean uh, bright red uh, i mean dark red in color when baby is having jaundice baby might appear yellowish so this thing can be observed without disturbing the baby and then if at all baby is crying listen to the crying so if either if it is a hunger cry it appears it hears something and if it is high pitched cry then you should think of cerebral irritability then you can assess the movement also movements are normal or if there is any jitteriness preterm infants and uh, infant of a diabetic mothers uh, are usually very jittery and then movements also you look at the asymmetrical movements so when uh, you have clavicular fracture or abs palsy or brachial plexus nerve injury then you can have asymmetry of the movements then posture normally uh, a neonate a healthy neonate remains in a universal flexed portion all the joints will be in a flexed posture so look into it whether so by looking into the neonate you can pick up hypotonia or any asymmetry of the uh, posture like uh, when baby is having a spalsy you can on normal side the baby will be in a flexed posture on the type of spalsy side child the hands will be in extended posture the other observation you can uh, make out without disturbing the baby is the breathing pattern how are the baby is it baby is comfortably breathing or having retractions or grunting or having apnea and so you can make out all these things without disturbing the baby then once you have made out the things then uh, so these are the examples like see here the baby is looks uh, i mean lips look cyanotic so cyanosis central cyanosis here only the uh, bluish discoloration is limited to only uh, palms and uh, i mean soles so this is across acral cyanosis so here the baby is jaundiced so it looks appears yellowish then posture this is the universal flexion posture so all your joints will be in a flexed posture this is an healthy neonate then you can look into the breathing pattern so here you can see baby is having a slight subcostal retraction so these are the things you need to make out without disturbing the neonate
so then the next important aspect is vitals so the vital starts with uh, temperature heart rate respiratory rate capillary refill time oxygen saturation and blood pressure so the temperature so temperature should be taken uh, axillary and the normal temperature uh, varies between 36.5 to 37.5 degrees celsius and the axillary temperature is 0 0.5 to 1 degree celsius lower than the rectal temperature so core body temperature will be 0 0.5 to 1 degree celsius higher then heart rate so you should be obtained by auscultation and counted for a full minute the normal heart rate is 120 to 160 so if the infant heart rate is more than 170 to 180 you will have a tachycardic and before labeling as tachycardic make sure that infant is not crying or moving vigorously so um, infant is crying or moving vigorously naturally the babies tend to have a higher heart rate so you should not think uh, in those pathological terms then you assess the respiratory rate so the normal respiratory rate is 40 to 60 per minute and respiratory rate should be obtained by observation per full minute and newborns can have a periodic kind of breathing so capillary refill time so you blanch the skin over the sternum or palms and soles for 5 seconds and then you count 1001 and 1002 1003 so with 1001 corresponds to 1 second 1000 when you pronounce 1001 it corresponds to 1 second when you pronounce 1002 it corresponds to i mean second second i mean second so usually crt hmm, uh, lies below 2 to 3 seconds on the trunk and maybe as long as 4 seconds on the extremities and delayed capillary refill time indicates poor perfusion then oxygen saturation so of late oxygen saturation is uh, finding very much importance in neonatology so before discharging the baby you need to screen pulse oximetry screening has to be done uh, to look for the oxygen saturation so Pre-ductal and post-ductal saturation has to be taken. So that is on right hand and either of the foot, either it can be left or right foot. So you need to compare the saturation. So when both the <coughs> saturation, that is right hand and the foot saturations are more than 95 degree, 95 percentage or the difference is less than 3 percent, then unlikely baby is having any uh, congenital heart disease, especially uh, cyanotic congenital heart disease or duct dependent congenital heart disease so when the saturation persistently remains less than 90 percent then child requires further evaluation so if the saturation lies between 90 to 40 or the difference between right hand and the right foot is more than four percent again you need to rescreen i mean re-examine the child few hours later then you need to find whether child is falling into again into these three categories so if child saturations uh, remain in the same category or else if less than 90 degrees you need further evaluation so if child saturations comes to 95 more than 95 95 percentage and the difference is less than 3 percent then child has successfully passed the pulse oximetry screening and less likely having any significant congenital heart disease especially duct dependent congenital heart disease or cyanotic congenital heart disease then blood pressure so blood pressure is not routine not measured routinely so not normal blood pressure varies with the gestational and postnatal post ages usually blood pressures are measured in babies are ended in nicu so when indicated measure with proper new so then coming into the third aspect so body measurement so what are all the important body measurements you need to take weight length and head circumference so weight is measured using infantometer uh, so the, all these measurements should be plotted in a standardized growth curves for the infant's gestation age. So you need to plot it on the Panton's growth charts. And then no, weight of the full term infants at birth varies from 2.6 to 3.8 kg and babies less than 2.5 kg are considered as low birth weight and babies usually lose 5 to 10 percent of their birth weight in the first few days of after birth and regain their birth weight by 7 to 10 days and the weight gain varies between 15 to 20 grams per day minimal weight gain and then you need to measure the crown to heel length it should be obtained at admission and then weekly the acceptable newborn length ranges from 48 to 50 cent 52 centimeters at birth 
then you need to measure the head circumference the head circumference occipito frontal head circumference so while encircling the tape make sure that it covers the occipital prominence and on forehead it should pass over the supra orbital reaches okay so the head circumference should be measured at admission and then again at weekly so non stretchable tape should be used while assessing the head circumference the acceptable head circumference at birth in term baby is 32 33 to 38 centimeters so with body measurements you need to plot on this pattern growth charts and then label the child whether appropriately gestational age or small per gestational age or large per gestational age then coming to the important aspect of examination head to toe examination so head to toe examination starts with head and particularly scalp so in scalp you need to look for i mean in head you need to look for the size of the head whether baby is having microcephaly normal uh, head size or having microcephaly or macrocephaly are there any swellings of the scalp like caput succedaneum or cephalhematoma or uh, subgaleal hemorrhage any cuts any defects any birth trauma injuries uh, plus acuities and then you need to examine the fontanelles anterior fontanel posterior fontanel and then you look at the skull bones and mobility of suture line so these are the things you need to look in the head especially scalp so microcephaly and macrocephaly grossly by a naked eye examination itself you can label it as a macrocephaly or microcephaly and also by measuring the head circumference so here this child is this unit is having a microcephaly this because of hydrocephalus and this by naked eye examination itself you can label the child as a microcephaly head size so first thing is head size then are there any scalp swelling so you need to palpate the head for scalp swelling so inspection from inspection also you need you can pick up sometimes you need to palpate as well so you need to palpate for any scalp swelling so what are the scalp swellings you can have caput succedaneum cephal hematoma so we'll see the what is the what is caput succedaneum and cephal hematoma in the coming slides so there is one more swelling over the scalp so you could able to see a swelling a diffuse swelling over the occiput and nape of the neck so there is a subgaleal hemorrhage so these are all the swellings you can see on the uh, scalp molding so overlapping of skull bones along the suture lines this is a normal thing and usually resolves within days then you, the second swelling you can have is the caput succedaneum these are soft tissue swelling that crosses the suture lines with irregular borders usually seen in parietal or occipital surface and it is present at the time of birth itself and it usually resolves within the first few days of life itself and cephal hematoma it's a subperiostal bleed doesn't cross suture, li uh, suture lines and usually takes two to three days per appearance and it's a tense swelling so uh, babies having cephalhematoma, you need to uh, monitor for uh, ictus in this babies over two to three days. So babies having cephalhematoma at high risk of having significant pathological jaundice. So these babies most of the times require phototherapy. And subcalial hematite is a huge uh, bleed in the uh, subaponeurotic plane because of the all these because of either because because of birth trauma only and um, babies having subclavial hematoma can end up having shock so you need to carefully monitor this child and often you need to admit the child and look for uh, the vitals and then you have other uh, rare swellings like uh, cranial meningocele cranial encephalocele kind of thing. meningocele we only meninges will be herniated through the defect whereas in encephalocele uh, mostly you see cranial encephalocele in all the occipital area so most of the times along with the uh, meninges uh, cerebral cortex cerebral portions of brainstem will get herniated into that encephalocele and meningocele only uh, your coverings that is meninges are herniated without any brain contents so uh, most of the times cranial meningocele is seen over the gabella whereas uh, cranial encephalocele is seen in the occipital area then the other things you need to look at at of anterior fontanelle and posterior fontanelle so as long the head circumference is normal and suture lines are mobile size doesn't matter so size of the anterior fontanelle is doesn't matter as long as head circumference is normal and suture lines are mobile 
so sometimes you can end up having a large anterior fontanelle and the cause for large anterior fontanelle is hypothyroidism osteogenesis imperfecta hydrocephalus and sometimes uh, you can end up having baby can end up having small anterior fontanelle and the causes could be craniosynostosis or microcephaly and then you can have a depressed anterior fontanelle in a dehydrated neonate and bulging anterior fontanelle in meningitis and intraventricular hemorrhages then usually posterior fontanelle uh, closes by birth admitting only tip of the finger and the patent posterior fontanelle you should suspect hypothyroidism so you should evaluate hypothyroidism particularly in that uh, neonate then scalp defect so you can this is one of the scalp defects so basically this child uh, is a syndromic baby uh, patavu syndrome so patavu syndrome you can have aplasia cutis or this cap even in a normal i mean uh, non syndromic baby is a healthy neonates also you can end up ha uh, having this finding very rarely so aplasia cutis then you need to look at the skull bones and suture lines so these are the skull bones so frontal uh, temporal parietal occipital and then you need to look for the mobility of the these bones along the suture lines then you need to palpate the anterior fontanelle posterior fontanelle so overlapping of skull bones can lead to molding and then you can have caput succedendum over here cephalomatoma here so caput succedendum crosses it's a basically over the periosteum so basically it crosses the suture lines caput whereas uh, cephalomatoma is superiorstal it doesn't cross the suture lines and then uh, these are the things then sorry then face so coming to face so in face you need to look at eyes nose ears and mouth and, and grossly any syndromic features are there or not so eyes these are the things you need to look is there any squint you need to look at the sclera cornea conjunctiva iris pupils uh, pupillary reflex and then red reflex so um, i'll share few examples so this baby because of birth trauma ended up having a subconjunctal hemorrhage so it is usually a benign condition and usually results by two to four weeks then red reflex so with the direct ophthalmoscope you need to look for the red reflex so when you project an light through your direct ophthalmoscope a red reflex will be seen so here in the right eye when all the media is clear like you have a clear cornea clear anterior chamber and clear uh, with, uh, um, so clear media you can have end up having uh, a red reflex when there is any uh, discrepancy in this media like when you have a glaucoma or else a cataract or a retinoblastoma you can get a leucorrhea white reflex leucorrhea so you need to so babies normal babies should have a red reflex and this red reflex should be observed using direct ophthalmoscope in a dark room then congenital cap so when there is a cataract you can have a leucorrhea white reflex rather than red reflex then you need to evaluate that particular infant then ear ear you basically assess the ear for size shape position auditory canals preauricular sinus pits or skin tags and on eye you need to look for mongolite slant of the palpebral fissures i mean mongolite slant of the eyes anti mongolite slant so these are the other things then here you need to look for size shape position auditory canals and any preauricular sinus pits or skin tags then ear examination low set ears so when you draw a imaginary line from the outer canthus of the eye so you should uh, cut the ear into uh, it should pass through the ear into upper one third and lower two thirds if the whole the ear lies below that horizontal line then you label the unit having low set ear so low set ear there are certain differential diagnosis for low set ears like when you have a down syndrome you can have low set ears so then um, um, maybe down syndrome and down turner syndrome can have low set ears so those who are having ear anomalies usually have genito urinary anomalies because ear and genito urinary system develops at the same time so when one is getting infected the other also will get affected so when ear uh, during development ear is getting affected on the same timeline during the same timeline you have genito urinary development 
so even they get affected that's why when you have urinary anomalies look for any genital urinary anomalies in that particular child so these are normally developed outer pinna and these are abnormal so you can see abnormal size shape low set ears and abnormal uh, rotation as well so these are ear tags preauricular ear tags so here you can see preauricular ear tags so you need to evaluate this particular new unit for genital urinary anomalies then nose so the patency of each nostril should be assessed by passing uh, uh, right so when baby is crying uh, not cyanotic while at rest and um, disappearance of cyanosis by crying uh, then it makes that both the nostrils are patent so if there is any abnormality in such thing so you need to examine for the patency of each nostril to exclude coronal atresia by passing an ng tube then flaring of nostrils any deformation or evidence of septal injury so here child is having a dislocated nasal septum so you can see you can figure out so just by palpating at the tip of the uh nose you can figure out that septum has been dislocated and the basically this can be because of a birth injury then at, look at the mouth so what are the things you need to look at the mouth is there any cleft lip cleft palate tongue tie is there natural tie, natural teeth and then tongue size so these are the things you need to look in the mouth so this is a cleft lip neonate this is any unit with the unilateral cleft lip and as well as unilateral cleft palate so you could see then bilateral cleft lip and cleft palate then and these are the these are physiological finding newborns you can see a pearly white uh, uh, papillar lesions over the hard palate junction of the hard and soft palate and you label it as upstream pearls which is quite natural in healthy term units and usually results in one to two months reassurance is all the thing that is required and then mouth babies can have a soft tissue swellings like ranulus this is very rare in units and then tongue tie so this is a normal tongue and here a ankyloglossia tongue tie this is one more neonate with ankyloglossia so basically you need to observe these things and these are the neonates with the natural teeth so natural teeth are of two types uh, pseudo deciduous teeth and true de deciduous Treats. So true deciduity is uh, basically you can differentiate it by uh, taking a you know, dental x-ray. So when you take dental x-ray and when you could able to a clear root uh, for that uh, teeth then you label it as a true deciduity teeth and then nothing is required reassurance. So when you have a pseudo deciduous teeth so with the dental x-ray you could not uh, see any root for that particular teeth then it's high time you remove that particular natural teeth because these are the teeth that are more prone for aspiration so basically these teeth i mean pseudo deciduous teeth don't have a good support don't have a root so they are freely mobile and they can get easily get dislocated and baby might end up having aspiration so when you see a natural teeth take a dental x-ray and differentiate whether it is a deciduous teeth or a pseudo deciduous teeth and when it is a deciduous teeth just reassurance is required when the pseudo deciduous is plan extraction of the natural tooth then macroglossia you could see uh, tongue protruding out of the mouth so macroglossia differential diagram is um, back with weedman syndrome okay, in down syndrome so you can see macroglossia then oral thrush is basically a candle infection of the tongue or um, more often seen in a bottle fed end neonates and then neck so neck is very short neonates so you need to lift the chin and then examine the neck so you need to look for are there any cysts masses and webbing is there so cysts cystic hygromas thyroglossal cysts and then masses you can have sternocleidomastoid um, sternomastoid tumor goiter and then webbing so these are the things you need to look at the neck so here this neonate is having a sternocleidomastoid I mean, sternomastoid tumor basically it is a hematoma in the middle third of the sternomastoid muscle and this can lead to torticollis that is limitation of lateral rotation of the neck so then the other uh, thing is webbed neck so this is an unit with webbed neck so webbing of neck is seen in turner syndrome 
then coming to chest so chest you need to look for any supernumeric breast or nipples that is quite common in 10% of the neonates and the, is there any breast enlargement you need to see and that point of time only you need to counsel the pay, pay attendants because most of the times attendants will try to express the milk from uh, breast by squeezing so unnecessary squeeze and this kind of stuff can lead to infection of the breast and neonate end up might end up having breast abscess kind of stuff so when you say breast enlargement and these, these breast enlargement is a temporary transit one might be secondary to the maternal hormones you need to reassure the attendant and mother that those are normal and it will settle in due course of time so don't squeeze those breast enlargement and then other uh, abnormality you can come across in chest is unilateral absence or hyperplasia of pectoralis major muscle so that is poland syndrome or poland sequence sometimes you can and babies end up having widely spaced nipples and especially seen in turner syndrome and noonan syndrome so these are the things um and two more deformities in chest pectus carinatum and pectus excavatum pectus um, excavatum is quite common rather than pectus carinatum so pectus carinatum has seen in both are predominantly seen in males rather than females so pectus carinatum is pigeon shaped chest nothing but a narrow thorax with increased anterior epid diameter whereas pectus excavatum you can see the sinking of the lower part of the sternum sometimes a mild defect sometimes uh, uh, mothers uh, bring their neonate uh, with the complaints having a prominence over the uh, zephy sternal area which is nothing but on the tip of the zephy sternum might be prominent and this is a mild spectrum of pectus excavatum which is quite natural physiological and due course of time it will uh, gets resolved that is the thing you need to uh, communicate to the mothers and then severe variant of pectus excavatum is sinking of the lower uh, part of the star then coming to abdomen so the normal abdomen is usually in cylindrical shape you can see a distended abdomen so this baby is having a necrotizing enterocolitis so so abdomen can get distended then you need to look for so shape of the abdomen you need to look into it and then coming to umbilical cord so usually bluish white in color and will be having two arteries with umbilical vein so you need to assess the vessels in the umbilical cord as well whether two arteries and one vein is there or not sometimes babies can have single umbilical artery or four vessels umbilical cord then uh, it's high time for evaluating any congenital disorders particularly in those neonates having single umbilical artery or else four vessel umbilical umbilicus so four vessel umbilical means very rarely neonates can have two umbilical arteries and two umbilical vein. normally two umbilical arteries one umbilical vein. the variants are child can have one umbilical artery and one umbilical vein or else two umbilical artery and two umbilical veins so in both the scenarios you need to look for uh, other congenital anomalies in the neonate especially gastrointestinal anomalies then there is a meconium stained umbilical cord then you can have certain defects like gastroschisis and amphalosis so basically these are herniation of abdominal contents through the defect so when the defect is uh, in the umbilical area then you name it as amphalocele usually amphalocele has a covering of amnion then the most of the times overlooked part is genitalia so genitalia so when you have merle pattern so you you see penis and scrotum so in penis you need to measure the length and you need to look at the opening of the meatus and in scrotum you need to look the color rugae and palpate for the testis so the normal size of testis in term is 1.6 to 2.9 centimeters in length 1.1 centimeter to 1.8 centimeters in width so male genitalia penis so stretched penile length should be of minimum 2.5 centimeters less than 2.5 centimeters requires evaluation endocrinological evaluation and the opening of meatus is at the tip of the penis and phimosis is physiologically newborns so you should not worry about the phimosis aspect then sometimes infants can end up having the opening of meatus on the ventral side of the penis so this is labeled as hypospadiasis this is an abnormal finding 
then male genital is scrotum so in scrotum in full term neonate scrotum is full developed where is well developed with the deep rugae and both the testes are in scrotum but in 2 to 5 percent of the term males testes can remain undescended during the first few months so watch and wait till 6 months of age in preterm scrotum might be small with few rugae and depends upon the gestational age huh? uh, scrotum is small with the few rugae and testes are absent or high in the scrotum then abnormalities of scrotum so you can have undescended testes hydrocele lingual hernia so these are the things you need to look the first picture is a bilateral hydrocele so you need to uh, do trans elimination tests then not usually trans elimination test will be positive in hydrocele then here baby is having a bilateral direct inguinal i mean indirect inguinal hernia and then the second aspect is female external genitalia so in full term uh, female neonate the labia majora completely covers the labia minora in preterm labia majora is widely separated and you can easily make out the labia minora and then and the norm is clitoris recedes in length with increasing gestation age the normal mean clitoral length is 4 mm plus or minus 1.25 mm so clitoral enlargement with hyperpigmentation should raise suspicion of androgen excess so ch so you need to evaluate the baby in ch terms then withdrawal building is quite uh, a normal thing in a females basically it is a withdrawal of maternal hormones tends to bleeding usually on day 4 or day 5 uh, so basically it's a physiological thing and just you reassure the attendance so ambiguous genitalia so sometimes you can end up it's quite difficult to label it as a uh, male or female so such is the scenario so they can be large clitoris or bifid scrotum in such scenarios don't reveal the gender so you um, tell them you communicate the mothers by uh, telling uh, i mean by, by pronouncing only baby don't say whether male baby or female baby when you come across the ambiguous genitalia because ambiguous genitalia you, you need further endocrinological evaluation to, the, to give a gender assignment for that particular baby so when you come across ambiguous genitalia first thing is don't assign gender so make sure that you have not assigned any gender you have not revealed any gender uh, to the parents then anus so anus position patency size has to be seen so here the baby is having an imperfect anus so when ba babies are having imperfect anus 50 percent of the times are usually associated with anomalies like bacterial anomalies and 90 to 95 percent of the times imperfect anus are associated uh, anus is associated with a peri perineal fistula or fistula which can be at perineum or rectovaginal or recto urinary most of the times it is a peri perineum and it takes 24 hours to become evident for that particular fistula and absence or presence of visible fistula at the uh, perineum is a critical distinction in diagnosis and management of imperfect so when you have imperfect anus with perineal fistula then you you can have a gentle approach so just what the thing is you need to dilate the fistula and then uh, you can repair the um, defect later on whereas when uh, you come across an imperfect anus with rectovaginal or recto urinary fistula then definitely you need to do colostomy at that point of the time and then you can plan uh, repair primary repair later later part of life so that's the thing so when you have imperfect anus look for fistula where is fistula so if fistula is uh, uh, in the perineum then it's okay you dilate that fistula tract and then you can plan surgery electively i mean in later part of the life whereas uh, if you come across an imperfect anus with the uh, rectovaginal recta urinary fistula you need to perform colostomy at that point of time only then you plan repair later in later part of life so imperfect anus with perineal fistula so you can in such scenarios you can see meconium in perineum or rugal folds or vagina uh, so basically at that point of time you need to dilate to and relieve the intestinal dilate the fistula and you need to relieve the intestinal obstruction or primarily 
primary repair can be done beyond the neonatal period. Whereas the imperforate anus with no perineal fistula, in such scenarios, fistula may open into urinary tract or vagina in girls. And so, uh, these, are the, these are the findings. You can find meconium in urine, or while doing mesenal examination, you can see meconium. And basically, in such scenarios, you need to do cystogram, which shows the tract and temporary colostomy at that point of time is required and then primary repair later so these are the normal things so meconium should, baby should pass meconium in the first 24 hours of life and delayed passage of meconium may indicate imperforate anus or intestinal obstruction of Hirschsprung's disease and urine should be passed in the first 48 hours of life only then often overlooked uh, part of neonatal examination is uh, extremities, joints and spine. So in extremities you need to look for fractures, dislocations, polydactyly, syndactyly, uh, palmar creases, uh, there are any deformities. So you need to look. So here child is an abs palsy. And then see these are the normal palmar creases in a neonate. So sometimes you can end up having a single palmar crease. So if single palmar crease is, in, is limited only to one hand, then it can be quite normal. So if both the hands are having single palmar crease, then you obviously most of the times babies are usually syndromic and most common syndrome in such scenario will be Down syndrome. So then you need to look for a polydactyly. So polydactyly is usually seen some syndromic uh, babies. Syndactyly. So the attachment can be at soft tissue level only or else bone or nail and it can be partial or complete so partial only uh, uh, web extends from the base partially and complete when the uh, web from base to tip of the finger and uh, x-rays are required to determine the degree of fusion and you should refer to orthopedics so there is one more deformity and most common deformities in index is congenital talibus equinovirus or club foot so basically here the components are four foot inversion and action heel inversion equinus leg internal rotation so here you need to refer the child to um, orthopedics then you can have edema especially bilateral pedal edema is usually seen in Donner's syndrome then the other uh, uh, aspect is you need to look at spine and hips so inspect spine for any defects like meningocele, meningomyelocele or spinal dysraphism or uh, spina bifida occulta then examine hip for any development dysplasia so these are the things you can come across on in the back so while examining spine look for these abnormalities like spina bifida occulta where the defect usually a, is a, uh, hidden and in spina bifida with meningocele only meningeal coverings will be herniated through the defect whereas in spina bifida with meningomyelocele both spinal cord contents and as well as meninges will get herniated through the defect whereas in spina bifida with the myeloscysis that is spinal dysraphism uh, the productive covering gets disrupted and the whole the uh, spinal cord contents are exposed to the environment so these are the things you can pick up so these are cases meningomyelocele so this is how it looks so here only here only you can see only coverings are herniated through the defect whereas here along with the coverings that is a meningomyelocele along with the coverings you could see uh, spinal cord contents being herniated through the meningomyelocele so basically examination of back is very much important then hip examination for any developmental dysplasia of hip that is ddh the usual incidence is 11.5 of 1000 infants so all newborn should be screened and in those with the risk factors uh, you need to screen very frequently and confirmation should be done mostly by ultrasound at six weeks of life so what are the risk factors for developmental dysplasia of hip female gender firstborn positive family history and breech presentation and a positive screening test 
then it is also an risk factor for ddh so what are the tests you perform for looking for ddh so it is a galaxy sign or autonomy in barlow's test and these tests become unreliable after three months of age so galaxy what is galaxy sign so you make the child uh, to make the unit to in a uh, uh, supine position and you flex the legs at the knee so if if you see any shortening abdominal shortening of a trilling then it is a galaxia sign or else any uneven screen increases seen on the uh, dislocated side so these are the two findings in a galaxia sign then bottle barlow's and not alone test so barlow's test basically you dislocate the hip by adducting the hip and gentle downward pressure see you could see so you need to flex the uh, hip joint as well as at the knee joint and you try to adapt the hip joint say at the same time you need to gently uh, give a downward uh, push so that the uh, dislocatable joint gets dislocated and you could hear a clunk sound so basically that is barlow test where is an orthal knee test where you, you relocate the dislocated joint by abducting the abducting and move, doing a forward movement i mean here adducting and downward movement here uh, abducting and forward movement so that the dislocated hip gets relocated and again you could hear a clunk sound so these are bar barlow's and octolin test for uh, developmental dysplasia of hip then skin so skin should be considered as an organ system and you need to evaluate from head to toe especially skin so in skin you need to look for jaundice plethora sinusitis long ago here hemangiomas any rashes purpura ecchymosis mottling vernix seriosa edema mongolian spots so these are the usual findings you can come across in skin so basically how to test nectrus in a baby is you blanch the skin for five seconds and see if uh, the base of the skin remains pale or it is yellowish so if the base of the skin i mean once you blanch the skin and you see paleness then there is no nectrus once you blanch the skin and you see yellowish discoloration then significant uh, levels of uh, jaundice uh, hyperbilirubinia have been seen so um, grammar scaling is will be there where you look for Ictras by blanching the skin over forehead, sternum, abdomen, thighs, palms, and soles. Uh, so, when the ictras is limited to uh, face, um, the expected joint levels is up to 5 milligrams per deciliter. When it is uh, limited to trunk, uh, it can be up to 7 to 8. When it is uh, uh, limited to abdomen, then it can be up to 10 to 12. When it is reaching thighs arms then it can be 12 to 15 and when it is uh, involves palms and soles it can be beyond uh, 15 so basically grammar staging of ictrus so this is how you need to look for ictrus so blanch the skin and look for the color tone i mean color so whether it is if it, re it remains paler then there is no ictrus if it is looking alloy then uh, jaundice is present then vernix seriosa this is a lubricant found on the skin skin folds and disappears as the fetal uh, fetus ages almost absent in post infant so basically it insulates the baby then purpura it also has antibacterial property as well then you can uh, see purpura in a unit so the, especially it can be a quite common uh, in units then motling this is basically because of immature autonomic nervous system then mongolian spots you can see dark bluish especially over the sacral part of the sacrum sacral part of the baby and it, it, it is also a quite normal thing and it usually disappears by one to four years of life and we can have abnormal scaling like in this colloid in baby then you can have rashes like milia, erythema toxicum, bullus sympatico, diaper rash, knee white. So white papules are less than 1 mm in diameter scattered across the forehead, nose and cheeks. These are sebaceous retin cysts and these disappear within one week. Then you can have erythema toxicum, white vesicles with red base. 
usually appears at 48 hours of life and disappears by one week and the transient and benign nature just reassurance is not that is required then we can have candida diaper dermatitis so frequent use and prolonged use of diapers can lead to candida diaper dermatitis so we need to look the diaper area especially for any dermatitis then photo and stick these are non blanchable macules seen over the face and may be associated with retinal or intracranial hemangiomas so next come to organ system so respiratory system so in respiratory system observe the respiratory pattern where it is normal or periodic breathing and then chest movement symmetrical chest movements are not there or not then retractions and tracheal tugging then auscultation normal vascular death sounds are heard or not any uh, grunt is there these rails so these kinds of things you need to examine the respiratory system which is quite normal in a pediatric as you do in a child or an adults just like in child or adults and cardiovascular also seem on those similar terms so look for any tachycardia increased pericardial activity auscultation and palpate especially important one important thing is palpate for femoral pulse so absent femoral pulses might indicate a coarctation of aorta and bounding pulses often indicate pda then abdomen so liver may be palpable 1 to 2 cm so these are the normal findings in a healthy new unit 1 to 2 cm below the costal margin spleen can be tip can be palp palpable then you can have abdominal masses abdominal distension scaphoid abdomen then you need to look again look at the umbilical stump any bleeding is there, meconium straining is, straining is there, granuloma, discharge, inflammation. Then are there any abdominal defects like complosil and gastroscitis. So these are the things you need to look in the abdomen. Then the most important part of our organ system assessment is CNS and reflexes. So CNS can be assessed in five aspects, higher mental functions, cranial nerve examinations, motor, sensory and reflexes. So higher mental functions, you need to look at the activity of the child, alertness of the child, arousal of the child, how is responding to the environment. So these are the things you need to, and even the cry of the baby. So these are the things you need to look in the higher mental function. So next coming to cranial nerve examination. So it's will skip cranial nerve examination. So I have summarized cranial nerve examination at the end. Let's have a look at it. So first cranial nerve that is olfactory cranial nerve cannot be examined because uh, um, smell sensation is established at three months of life so olfactory examination is quite not possible in a new unit so you can assess rest of the cranial nerve examination by doing these reflectors so when you throw light into the uh, into the eyes of the baby so babies will blink so usually this blink, blink reflex gets established at 28 weeks of gestation and when there is a positive blink, blink reflex so you have successfully tested cranial nerve 2 that is optic nerve and as well as uh, facial nerve that is cranial nerve sub then pupillary, pupillary, uh, pupillary reflex so when you throw some light into the uh, eyes of the baby you see pupils being contracted that is positive pupillary reflex which gets established at 32 weeks of gestation and with this you could uh, successfully able to test optic nerve and, uh, and trochlear uh, that is cranial nerve 3 then fixing and following objects sorry uh, optic and oculomotor then fixing and following objects so with fixing so when you throw light or uh, show some objects they usually fix on that object and they follow that object so with that you can successfully test cranial nerve 2 that is optic oculomotor uh, trochlear and abdicin so basically you assess the extraocular movements of the eyeball so this fixing and following objects is established at 34 weeks of life and then when you give a gentle stimulus to the face and baby starts grimacing then you have successfully tested cranial nerve 5 and cranial nerve 7 so cranial nerve 5 is the one which carries the sensations of the face and the uh, efferent uh, response is uh, grimacing that is uh, using the facial muscles which are innervated by facial nerve that is cranial nerve 7
then uh, you look at the facial symmetry by the rest and movements which tests cranial nerve 7 then startle reflex mm, so when you make sound babies can have startle reflex it is more like a moral reflex but the, here the stimulus is uh, uh, auditory stimuli so with that babies can have startle reflex so when babies are having startle reflex then you have successfully tested uh, eight the uh, cranial nerve then it's sucking reflex so mm, you keep the pacifier into the mouth so if the baby starts sucking then you have successfully tested fifth now seventh now and nine uh, twelfth now that is hyperglossal which innervates the tongue muscles then with sucking comes the swallowing so when you observe for uh, when baby swallows then you have successfully tested glossopharyngeal and vagus now then for uh, 11th cranial now you rotate the head towards one side and palpate uh, the sternocleidomastoid muscle when you feel the tightness of the sternocleidomastoid muscle then you have successfully tested the um, uh, 12th cranial now so this is how cranial now examination has to be done in a neonate then coming to motor aspect so motor aspect can be assessed by looking at the posture and tone so posture this is the usual posture of the newborn where you can have universal flexion of the all the joints and then tone tone can be assessed by pull to sit and uh, um, by uh, hanging the baby with the with the arms and you see the legs are drawn upwards not dangling downwards and then pull to sit then uh, baby is holding the baby in prone position and looking for the head lift uh, arm uh, hands lift hands lift then uh, these are the things uh, um, ways you can assess the tone so this is how uh, implant is held and you could see here uh, usually the lower limbs are drawn upwards you remain in a flexible posture if you uh, hold the baby over the axilla here the baby is hypotonic so that's why the both the lower limbs are dangling downwards as if baby is not having any tone in the muscles so this is a hypotonic child then here you can see abnormal posture, opisthotonic posture, um, either from kernectoros or meningitis. So this baby is basically having E. coli meningitis. Then sensory examination. So sensory examination is quite limited because you can't test other sensations like vibration, sense, proprioception. So those are not quite possible. The only sensation you can test in newborns is by uh, fine touch by applying a sharp end of the cotton uh, on the face and observing the facial grimace or changing the state of the infant so the same thing you can carry out from head to toe and you look for the change in the state of infant then the most important part of the CNS examination is neonatal reflex so neonatal reflex are also developmental or primary or primitive reflexes these are autonomic behaviors behaviors that don't require any higher level of brain functioning and basically it assesses the integrity of nervous system they are absent if there is any cns depression and often these are productive and disappear as higher level functions emerge so the most important uh, neonatal reflex is morose reflex so we'll see how morose reflex is elicited so basically morose reflex starts appearing at 28 weeks of gestation and full mature morose reflex is seen at uh, 32 weeks of life and it starts disappearing at uh, 4th month of life and it's totally disappeared by 6th month of life. So it is the most important reflex in neonatal period. So here you have a you give a stimulus and you look for the response what is the stimulus so baby is held in a supine position elevated is held by your hand then allow the baby allow the head to drop suddenly so when you drop the head suddenly you see a response so what is the response so initially you will see extension of back extension abduction of upper limb flexion and reduction of the upper limb with opening of fingers and crying so this is the usual response of a uh, moros reflex so what is the significance of moros so when there is bilateral absence of moros you can have cn uh, the cause could be cns depression uh, in the form of narcotics or anesthesia or hypoxia carnictorous very premature baby 
um, so in those are noodles you can have uh, absence morals asymmetric morals is seen in only one side it is seen so it is usually seen herbs palsy fracture clavicular hemorrhages so persistence of morals beyond sixth month of life indicates cns damage then the other important reflex is sub sucking reflex when a finger or nipple is placed in the mouth the normal infant will start to suck vigorously and this appears at 32 weeks of uh, gestation and disappears by 3 to 4 months of life so these are this is not the ideal way of eliciting sucking reflex so you should not keep your fingers rather you keep the baby's finger uh, uh, into the mouth of the baby so that baby tries to suck his or her fingers only so this is not the ideal way of examining suckling reflex sucking reflex then other important reflex is rooting reflex so it gets well established at 30 to 30 weeks of gestation and disappears by 3 to 4 months of life and elicited by uh, stroking the upper lip or corner of the infant's mouth so what is the response you saw the stimulus is stroking the upper lip or corner of the infant mouth the response you see is infant turns towards to that stimulus and opens its mouth basically uh, infant response on the thinking in terms of breast i mean so this is how it is seen so then coming to palmar graphs so it is well established 13 weeks 36 weeks of gestation disappears by four months elicited by examiner uh, um, uh, placing the examiner's finger on the palmar surface of the infant's hand and infant's hands grasp the finger so you need to press the palm of the um, infant by placing your finger so then infants try to grasp like this so that is how you test the palm organs so uh, attempts to remove the finger result in tightening so as you try to remove the uh, finger baby tries to catch hold that uh, increases the grip of the um, uh, finger so this is how you need to do so technique is put the examiner finger in the baby form slight rubbing the infant grasp the finger firmly so significance is when there is absent grasp reflex then it is a cns depression when there is persistent grasp reflex then it indicates cns damage in stepping reflex so uh, onsets at 35 to 36 weeks of life and disappears by 6 weeks of life elicited by touching the top of the infant's foot to the edge of the table where the infant is held upright so infant makes uh, movements that resemble stepping so hold the baby in upright position uh, while his soul touches the table stepping movement uh, starts then placing so when dorsum of the baby foot touches the under surface of the table flexion of hip and knee and you see flexion of hip flexion of knee and then extension uh, to place the uh, foot on the table so this is how placing reflex is done so basically in stepping reflex you touch the you make the baby to touch the uh, ground with his sole so he tries to steps he makes steps uh, I mean, whereas in placing reflex, you bring the dorsum of the foot towards the edge of the table. So the response is seen is seen in flexion of hip, flexion of knee, and then baby tries to step over the table. That is placing reflex. So then one more important uh, neonatal reflex is tonic reflex or fencing posture. So asymmetric tonic reflex usually evident at 4 weeks of uh, life and disappears by 7th month of life. Elicited by rotating infant's head from midline to one side, the infant should respond by extending the arm on side to which head is turned and flexing the opposite arm. Usually appears at birth and persistent beyond 9 months indicates cerebral palsy. So they, how this? So you take the head to the right. So head turns to this side and there shall be extension of the arms as well as the leg whereas the opposite side gets flexed so that is how you test the asymmetric tonic reflex so these are the timelines of neonatal reflex so more important neonatal reflex more of palmar plantar uh, rooting and tonic so usual appearance and then disappearance so then the other important aspect is estimation of gestational age so there are three ways of estimating gestational age by history you uh, with the help of lmp and ultrasound scan you can 
assess the gestation age and by looking at newborn through new ballard score you can assess the gestation age so how newborn uh, ballard score assessment is done let's see so it is usually performed at 12 to 24 hours of life and you have two components a physical maturity component neuromuscular maturity component and there are six component uh, sub components in part in this uh, uh, each co component I, i mean you have six sub components under neuromuscular maturity component and you have six component sub components under physical maturity and usually the occurrence of one week so in physical maturity score you see you look at the skin lanugo plantar creases nipples and brush and then ear uh, firmness and gen genitals and neuromuscular component you see is posture square window arm recoil popliteal angle scar sign and heel to ear so this is the chart so you tick at where the child and uh, i mean preterm belongs then you have score here and then each scoring corresponds to a particular gestational age so if you assess the neuromuscular maturity scoring and physical maturity scoring the score has come around 30 then corresponding gestation age is 36 weeks so you can label that the child is 36 uh, gestational age is a 36 gestational age then assessment of feeding so more often some examiners uh, say assessment of feeding should be included in the exam ex in examination of a newborn as well so in assessment of feeding you see position attachment should be checked and the four components of proper attachment that is proper latching is my mouth wide open uh, areola most visible above uh, uh, than below and chin touching the breast and the lips averted so assessment of feeding as uh, also the part of your examination so let's summarize the thing so first thing is for an undergraduate level uh, examiners lay more emphasis on your approach towards the newborn examination rather than your findings so in in your examination most of the times the healthy newborns are uh, are kept so you don't have much findings to tell so so the emphasis laid more towards your approach so how you approach to the neonatal examination i mean are you following the sepsis guidelines that is folding your cups removing your watches bangles rings uh, have you washed hands thoroughly before examining the chain and have you taken proper uh, uh, history i mean full complete history uh, then uh, so these are the so emphasis is laid on more towards how your approach rather than your findings so at the end of your examination you need to summarize all the things what you have seen so so and so you need hours of life male or female uh, you tell about the gestational age whether the baby is ag or sg or lg then delivered by a vaginal delivery or any instrumental delivery or LSES. Yes. So if it has a LSES, yes, what is the reason behind it? So baby uh, cried immediately after birth or not? Then any significant findings postnatally? So that's how you need to keep the things together and you need to uh, summarize the things. And final diagnosis should include similar on similar terms only term pre-term or full term or post term then uh, uh, delivered by a gestational age you should tell lses or else uh, uh, vaginal delivery then um, gender of the uh, baby then baby cried immediately after birth or not then aj or lg or sga so these are the terms so you need to give the final diagnosis so with final diagnosis after the final diagnosis the other important aspect is you need to explain all those things to the mother so whatever you have made uh, you have uh, concluded in the child you need to tell so whether baby is fine doing well so you need to tell along with that you need to advise the new instruction regarding breastfeeding um, what are the ways to increase breastfeeding what is the importance of breastfeeding uh, impo importance then you need to um, advise about the pro importance of providing warmth care to the baby then immunization schedule you need to uh, discuss then when to follow up these are the things you need to um, discuss with the mother or the attendant 
and the most important thing uh, uh, of the annual examination is documentations today we live in an environment of medical legal implications and complications so definitely whatever you have examined the baby and whatever you have instructed to the mother you need to document it in the uh, discharge notes so if you are, you might be a good doctor you have a very good skills and you may be a famous doctor but when you don't document what you have done then you may end up being sued by the parents even if it is a if even if you have done properly so documentation is important so documentation basically so whatever you have discussed till now it is helping the mother and baby so documentation is to help yourself for medical legal negligence so that's how i like to wind up the things thank you